search for apps. Um, and I'm very pleased um, that he's here with us today. And I want to welcome Tomara. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks a lot for the kind introduction. And I'm actually going to um, do the presentation a slightly different approach. Um, so I think many people in this room have actually spoken to in the past. And so I believe many people in this room actually know what we do. So I'm not going to take too much time to go over it. Um, so as Trevor said, my name is Tomer. I'm the CEO and founder of Quixie. Uh, we in Quixie believe in discovery of apps. We believe people should be using 60, 100, 200 apps in their everyday life, seamlessly, flawlessly, through every experience, and enhancing their life through those experiences. Uh, we work with partners. We work with carriers, device manufacturers, operators, third-party app ecosystems, and we work with them to actually derive a better uh, app experience, an app discovery experience. So that's what we do as Quixie, and if you have any more questions, you can speak to me, you can speak to Jacob, back there, our uh, head of business development. Um, and like I said, I think many people in this room have actually spoken to in the past. So that's Quixie. I actually want to talk a little about the challenges and opportunities around the app ecosystem and the growth of the app ecosystem. Um, over at Quixie, we're actually able to see a lot of information. We work with many different partners. We uh, see, you know, we, we basically crawl uh, app data all across the web, and we have uh, one of the largest collections of apps in the world. Uh, in our directory, and we, we see a lot of trends. And I think sometimes those trends are overlooked. Uh, many times I think, um, as, as I speak to investors, are looking at the, the trends today, but aren't really seeing the tip of the iceberg of what's happening six months, a year down the line. So that's where I'm gonna go with this presentation. Um, so, move on. so let's talk about sort of what is apps and the growth of apps. I, I, I kind of wanted to highlight sort of the early days of apps and the early days of the web, and just kind of show a correlation. If you actually take a look at it, you'll see that uh, the growth of uh, all apps across all major app stores and the growth of uh, you know, websites, and today there are roughly 196 million websites, um, actually parallel very, very closely. If you look at what's happening uh, right now, uh, they're continuing parallel very, very closely. Uh, so the growth of apps is actually looking to be about the same as uh, growth of websites. Now the reason that's interesting is uh, it parallels itself all the way out to C96, and if you actually go the last um, last couple of years, the last two years of that growth, same thing around 97, 98. The funny thing is the web had an explosion around 98. Um, the amount of sites actually took off, passing a million, jumped quickly to 15 million, and after that to about 60 million. Uh, and so the question is, is, even though we've been keeping up with websites as apps, is that same explosion going to happen? And I think that's a very, very interesting question and I wanted to explore some of the uh, some of the things that are influencing that. Now, um, you know, we could take a lot of time talking about challenges. I think people are going to talk about monetization. That's like the known huge challenge. How do you monetize every app? Uh, I'm going to kind of avoid that. And I'm going to be avoiding the word challenges. I'm going to talk about opportunities because I think every one of these are basically opportunities. I think many people in this room are taking advantage of these opportunities. So what happens when apps grow, right? Let's look at the scenario of what happens if apps do take off. What does that mean? Um, first of all, it means where do they live? Uh, you know, apps, it's kind of this weird definition. What is an app, right? If you talk to the guy Mozilla in the room, he'll tell you, well, an app is just an HTML5 website. And an HTML5 website that can be wrapped around something that you call an app, same thing as an app, right? It's functionality. Um, you talk to the guys over at, at Google about the future of Google Glasses, they'll tell you, well, you know, apps are going to be running on Google Glasses, right? So uh, you're going to be talking to people who run PCs, people talking to tablets. Uh, car companies, if you talk to Ford, you talk to BMW, they'll tell you apps. Well, apps are just the new way you're going to be interacting with your car. You're going to be talking to guys over at Samsung, and they'll tell you that TVs are the future of apps and app discovery. So what are really apps is kind of this interesting notion. Um, you know, and it's not just in hardware. You also look at companies like Salesforce and Evernote, which are creating you know, very large app ecosystems. Evernote just passed 9,000 apps in, in their Evernote trunk which is a, quite a daunting number. Um, so when we look at apps, you have to remember, apps basically live and exist across many ecosystems, across many devices. And here in Silicon Valley, we oftentimes forget this. Uh, and we forget what the rest of the world is experiencing. Um, so what, what are they really experiencing? I think one of the things that we're forgetting about is that um, with, you have a huge growth of apps, right? And you have a huge growth of platforms. Not every app is going to be worth a billion dollars. In fact, there are very few companies on the web worth a billion dollars. 
Not every app has to monetize to the tune of hundreds of millions even. In fact, many of the apps out there will never monetize much. Likewise, many websites will never monetize. They'll be useful, um, but they won't be highly monetizable. Or they'll monetize in ways which are indirectly linked to the app. So uh, one of the key themes I want to bring up that nobody really talks about much, but we're seeing right now in our system a huge growth in, and where I believe that, that you know, the graph is going to climb, is a concept of localized apps. Um, I was just in New York a few weeks ago, and I was talking to a number of companies over at the Search uh, Marketing Expo. And these companies weren't the kind of companies that you and I think about in everyday lives. They were grocery store owners, a barber shop, a injury law firm, and they all had apps. And they all were asking me, how can I get my app discovered? That's an interesting question, right? If you're a corner grocery store and you have an app for that specific <coughs> store in New York, you're not going to make a top 10, right? And actually, you don't want to be in a top 10. That's not your goal. So, uh, you know, what kind of apps are these? Well, the grocery store app is really cool. Uh, once you're in the store, it gives you some suggestions for dinner meals, and then it shows you where in the store to get every one of the items. And if you collect them all, you get 10% off. And they real time create recipes to get things like salmon off the shelves. Um, I talked to the store owner, he said, you know, of people using this app, they saw an increase, 20, 30% increase in how much money they're willing to spend in the store. Now, that's a highly monetizable app, right? That's fantastic. And then his question was, okay, how do I get people to use it? So, of course, the question was, how, you know, what are you doing today? And he goes, well, I, I make these billboards with QR codes and we just put them around the store. And I'm hoping someone sees it, right? And, uh, and I send guys out to the streets around, the blocks around the store, and they're handing out flyers that just have QR codes. And we're just like hoping someone finds this app. So that was very interesting, right? It's like this app. Um, you have something like a barber shop, same thing as the personal injury uh, lawyer. You also have things like, you know, as the example shows their Dreamforce, right? Dreamforce had actually a, an entire suite of apps just for that event. Uh, most conferences these days have a minimum of one app, right? Every airport that you've flown into has their own app. And in fact, some airports have competing apps about which app actually gets you better data. Um, you know, talk to the guys at Mobile Roadie, and the increase of localized apps for specific events is just astronomical. Uh, so what we're actually seeing today is a growth of apps. And the response to this growth of apps is going to be interesting. The app ecosystem and the app stores aren't really suited to take these in. Um, one of the companies I spoke to in New York had created 2,000 hyper-local apps in the last year until Google gave her a call and said, you need to slow down. Uh, and she goes, well, it wasn't, you know, they thought that she was spamming the store, right? Because she was out there basically creating, you know, apps for grocery stores, for barbershops, and she was creating these tools and repackaging the tools for all these different stores. And they go, well, you know, there's already a barbershop app. She goes, yes, but there's another barbershop across the street. Well, it's the same app, you know, it's the same functionality, we don't need two of them. Well, you know, she had to explain, well, well, you do because they're two different companies. They each have similar functionality, but they each want to use their app because it's going to enhance the experience at the store. So uh, the point that she made was that it was a very difficult conversation, right? When you have people running a store, right, with a top 10 list, they're not really thinking about a world where there's millions or hundreds of millions of interactions around us. They're thinking of a world where there is a, you know, zero-sum game and there is every day a winner and every day a loser. That mentality is about to change. We're on the cusp of, I believe, in the next two years, see a growth of not just apps that are hyper-localized based on location and you know, mom and pop stores, but we're gonna see a bunch of hyper-localized for contextual, for events that are happening, for things like Hurricane Sandy, for things like you know, your personalized experience and an app that was created for your specific medical condition. Um, we're already seeing them right now hitting our system and hitting hard, and we believe in the next two years they're gonna grow. Same way that HTML5 apps are going to make it much, much easier and they're going to start growing. So we really believe that the whole store, store ecosystem right now is in threat. And then every time there's a threat, there's a great opportunity. Okay, so uh, wh why, why is this happening? Why is this hyperlocalization happening? Why, you know, what am I even talking about? Why does it matter? Um, the way we looked at it, going back to that original slide, was that you know, there's a trend, right? And the trend was when the web took off, Everybody believed they had to have a website. It was how you legitimize yourself. Every mom and pop, every single company, everybody said, well, I'm going to have a website, right? Would you ever work with a law firm that didn't have a website? Of course not, right? I actually ended up not using my dentist and switching dentists because they didn't have a website. I didn't know how to, I was going to reschedule my appointment. I had no idea how to. I couldn't find a website. So I, I went to one that had a website. Um, but that was sort of the 90s, right? Everyone has to have a website. Then the 2000s came, and every business that was legitimate 
you know, followed the big brands and said, well, you know, Nike has a Facebook page. I want a Facebook page too. And, you know, and Ashton Kutcher, he, he tweets and that's popular. Well, I'm going to have a Twitter account. And so we started seeing is in the 2000s uh, the concept of now you have your social mark, right? Everyone now has a website and they started listing. Of course, you know, email signatures got longer. You had the website, the Facebook page, the Twitter handle. The, I mean, you just became much, much longer. You got your social presence. <coughs> what we're seeing today is all those same companies that did one and then did the second are looking at the third. And it's not, you know, we say apps, but it's the interactive experience. Right? Every company that saw that they're going to legitimize themselves by having a presence on the previous two believes now that to legitimize their existence, they need to have something that somebody can run on their phone, on their tablet, on the new device, new system. Once again, huge opportunity because there is a lot of these guys, and very few of them have yet converted, but they're about to. In the next two years, they're going to convert at an astronomical rate. Um, we're seeing the slope increase, and from our viewpoint, if you actually take into account websites that are actually now adapting themselves, right? Things like uh, every player in the NFL is about to get their own app. The fact that basically mom and pop stores in New York are about to basically launch 2,000 apps there and also everything from barber shops to stores to personal injury lawyers, you know, it's astronomical. It's the tens of millions, possibly over the next five to ten years, hundred million apps. So with the apps exploding everywhere, one of the key features is apps are defining the hardware. Um, every, when you look at the, the statements made from Bomber when they released Windows 8 and you look at the statements made from RIM on BB10, many of the statements revolved around how many apps are on the system and what they're doing to reach out to developers, right? The existence of apps now represents the idea of functionality, right? The ability that for us to have a varied functionality, and this is key. Um, to convert users, some of the biggest companies are looking to have not just the top apps, as many have found, it's they also need the specific niche apps to convert to specific users. So I'll, I'll give you a great example. If you were, let's say, a diabetic and had an iPhone, and there are about 15 major diabetic apps on the iPhone today, and you relied on this to actually take your medication, how easily would you switch to a Windows device that had no diabetic apps? I mean, you just wouldn't. It would actually be detrimental to your own being. Uh, this is actually a problem. The original concept of having just the top 10, top 20 apps on your system is no longer enough to convert. And this is actually causing a strain. Um, some of the guys over up at Redmond are actually reaching out to these niche communities, paying upwards of $50,000 to create an app. Basically, create an app to convert a user. And that's the concept. What is the, they're looking at what is the app, the one app that would actually cause you to convert. And it turns out for most people, it's not Angry Birds. It turns out for most people, it's that app they use for their everyday fitness. It's the app they actually kept their recipes in. It's, you know, it's very niche for each individual user. And you think of your own everyday app usage, there's a few apps you can't live without. How do you identify them? Once again, a great opportunity in the space, identifying the niche apps to convert individual users. And actually an opportunity for any hardware maker out there. Okay, so with all these apps everywhere, let's look back at the developers. And the developers have been talking HTML5 for a while, right? This, and sort of the question is, well, is it dead? Is it not dead? Where is it going? HTML5 represented something amazing. It, it represented freedom, right? It represented the concept of building one solution, as you did for the web, and now being available everywhere, right? Uh, you talked about things like reactive or responsive or adaptive UI. I just had a, a discussion earlier about which, you know, which one means what. But there is a huge push to create a single functionality that can live everywhere. It makes more sense for the developers. It makes more sense for the end hardware users. Um, but it's not solved. There are a lot of problems. We might call HTML5 the reality. W3C will call HTML X. There's a lot of new standards that have to be created. <coughs> Same way that when the web first started, e-commerce was not possible. New standards had to be created. HTML2 had to actually grow and, and mature and actually allow for e-commerce, allow for security, allow for better discovery, uh, allow for transferring of objects, of files, uh, personas. And then we got to what we are today, HTML5, allowing to play video, allowing to play content. But there's still a lot missing. Um, I was actually just at the W3C conversation uh, a couple days ago. Um, the chatter is enormous. And there's an enormous opportunity for every company to get involved in sort of what are the new standards. HTML5 is old. From the position of every major company working on how to progress the web, it is not the exact fit that we're going to need to actually grow in the next five years. There's a lot missing, a lot of holes. 
a lot of opportunities around monetization, standards of monetization, standards of ad units, standards of things such as uh, reactive UI to different landscapes. How do you actually handle things like geo or full contextual awareness? And these are not built into HTML5 whatsoever. There's a lot of apps today that have to be native because the, the functionality they're looking to have happen hasn't actually been derived yet. No one has actually figured it out and placed it as a standard into the standard web development. So while all the developers are screaming for freedom, they're actually looking to the larger companies, to the people in this room, and to the affiliates of the people in this room to actually solve this for them, right? To create the, the mechanism for that. So once again, enormous opportunities around helping drive developers to the virtual world. Now, when I say, you know, HTML5 is at freedom, I really mean, of course, being virtual. Uh, next slide, right? And what does a virtual world really mean uh, for us and for these developers? So one analogy we like to use actually at Quixie is you look back at the desktop. And I don't really know about you guys, but in the mid-90s, I had a nice PC. It was big. I kind of built it myself. And um, I had you know, files and folders, right? So I had these folders. And in these folders, I had a bunch of apps, right, like freeware. I remember I downloaded like, Commander Keen. And I downloaded Jazz Rabbit. And I had all these games I downloaded from the web. And I also was installing CDs. And I would have folders. And these folders were other folders. And those folders contained more applications. And my computer at any given point probably had a few hundred applications on it. Awesome. Well, as the web progressed and actually the, band, uh, the, the, band, the bandwidth got better and better, what started happening is I wasn't downloading freeware. I was playing Flash games. And I wasn't downloading um, you know, you know, my own personal money management system. I was using Mint. And you know, email was no longer on Outlook. I was actually just going to Gmail. And slowly but surely, more of the applications on my computer went away. Um, actually, if you map this out, the rate of application downloads is inversely proportional to the rate of PCs. What you see is the growth of the Mac had almost everything to do with the fact that people were no longer down downloading applications. The advantage the PC always had over the Mac is the fact that there was like a few orders of magnitude of applications, some which are highly necessary for business and for your personal life, that were actually running on your device. Um, you, you know, it was um, the Macs in the you know late '80s, early '90s were nice toys nice educational tools in the school, but you couldn't really bring them into the office. You couldn't really bring them to your home if you wanted to do anything serious. But as more and more of that functionality was moved to the web, then it became who has the better UI, who has the better UX, who has the best experience of actually going onto the web. Um, and that basically barrier to entry dropped. At the same time, what we're seeing today is with devices, it's all about the native app, right? It's how many native apps do you have, 60, 100? At the same time, Companies like Intel, Cisco, Qualcomm are working diligently to create APIs to write directly to the hardware, allowing for tools to actually take advantage of accelerations, of memory, of video graphics, directly on the device, and do it in a virtual environment. Um, for any of you who have actually visited Qualcomm recently, they have a really cool demo of a real-time racing game that you can play on two different phones, and it's actually fully, fully virtual. And it's pretty damn amazing. It's better than almost any native racing app I've ever seen. And it's run virtual. This is going to happen, right? Why, as I said before, the developers are asking for it. They are demanding it. They don't want to have to run and figure out how to use you know, 500 different Android devices. They want to figure out how to actually create a solution that, the same way the browsers are able to adapt, they can adapt for various browsers. It's easier to adapt to a browser environment than it is to just every hardware environment. Once again, a great opportunity for every hardware manufacturer, for every company looking to create a platform or service uh, to how to help bring these apps forward and how to help make that transition from that percent of native to virtual. Uh, finally, yes. before you go on, can, can I just ask you a question of course. along those lines? So when we have our PC, right, yes. it's usually a hardware connection yes. and so we can do all the online services much easier. Yes. So with the mobile, right, we don't get that good coverage in the cap the time. And then secondly, there's now limiting bandwidth. We don't have the unlimited data plans. It's almost a, it's a different scenario. How do you reconcile that? Sure. How um, will that be reconciled? So I think what you have right now is already increased bandwidth. And I think you're going to keep having better and better bandwidth. Um, I think those, those uh, limitations are going to tumble. The same way it actually is happening in London. If anybody's actually been in the UK recently, you know, there's a company out there called Three, right? Uh, Li Kai Xing opened up a, a company there, Three. What Three has brought was unlimited bandwidth. 
and they are converting users at an astronomical rate. Astronomical. Um, it's an opportunity, right? As more things, act, or as we do need more bandwidth, any limitation of bandwidth creates an opportunity for someone to come in and create a better pricing model. Uh, bandwidth is getting better, uh, some, you know, substantially better, uh, to the point that there's actually little difference between running a YouTube video on my phone than it is on running my PC from a UX perspective. I think that's always simplifying. Of course it is. I'm from sure. Deutsche Telekom, the venture. Yes. Venture arm of Deutsche Telekom. And um, it's not a physical problem, uh, it's a process problem. So you could theoretically in, invent new algorithms to use the spectrum that we have more efficiently. So people say, oh, but the spectrum is limited. But there's no reason why we shouldn't have better algorithms. The problem is you need a standard, so it's actually interchangeable. Yes. And that means in order to get to the standard, you need those processes. And that's going to take like eight or ten years. It, it might, yeah. It'll, take, it'll take a long time, I agree. The second, the second problem is um, because everyone is hyper-local and moves around and is very mobile, there's, it, it's really hard to create a rollout structure for broadband because you basically need to roll out broadband everywhere yes. because you don't know anymore where people actually are. And just saying, well, we need a good connection in San Francisco is not sufficient. You actually need to really have a connection like in every street. And um, there's a there's a limit of, of on the on the cost side on that. Like you know, a meter of fiber, for example, in Germany <coughs> costs around eight thousand euros to roll out. So I'll, I'll tell you something. I just bought a new Audi, and I'm paying monthly subscription for broadband for my Audi. Yeah. Right. And that Audi actually is a hotspot for all my devices, and it's fast, really, really fast. Yeah, I'm just um, saying it's, it's, it's a matter of scale. I, I agree. You know, so. I, I think the issue there is, but I think everyone's working on it. Everyone agrees it's sort of a problem that needs to be solved. Yeah. Um, you know, I saw a really good technology actually the other day that was actually working on um, making a video better by actually using the concept of when you download a video, let's say from YouTube, you're actually at the same time creating a, little, a bit of a hotspot to redistribute it. Because the concept of, you know, of things like video content are one of those things where it's a zero sum of it. You know, there's all of a sudden a hot video everyone wants to watch. So if everybody's downloading at the same time, you can actually create a really, you know, uh, instant hotspots everywhere that are basically sending out this video and actually utilizing everyone else's device to, you know, cause this, you know, faster redistribution. Uh, whether this company will take off, I think not. But <laughs> the concept is they're working on it. There's, uh, you know, there's there's financial backing. Uh, there's conversation, and you know, you said these algorithms, these standards, are in hot, you know, debate. Um, these are not, you know, I'm not describing solutions. I'm describing opportunities. And I think that companies like Deutsche Telekom are in a great position to try to solve some of these problems. But I think that companies like Deutsche Telekom are looking to Silicon Valley to, to find help, to but, create. But, but he makes a great point about the infrastructure costs of maintaining this, right? This is sure. all great if you're in London and San Francisco. Right. Drive your Audi out to see Mount Rushmore and how fast do you think your broadband is <laughs> in the middle of South Dakota. Right. right. So you virtualize your world. You're dependent on the cloud and your bandwidth, and now you're going to go outside of the huge population zone where it's not commercially reasonable to put that infrastructure. But sure. So, also on the caching algorithm, caching actually the one that is most <coughs> requested is a bad idea by any caching algorithm. It's counterintuitive, but there is a there is a reason for that. So in general, also on the in the broadband rollout, what you're talking about the the sharing of bandwidth and stuff. We have a huge problem with that already, with um, some some real noise problem, Wi-Fi wi noise, right? RC noise. I mean, there's there's a huge problem with that, and that's also the reason why you know on on live folded, right, with a pixel screening, because it, it's it's really hard to scale that. And not talking about the early adopters. I'm not even talking about the first wave of Facebook 1.0 or Twitter 1.0, right? I'm talking about this on a huge scale, and that makes it very very difficult. So, so I'll give you an example. Um, you know, in Q1, Firefox OS is going to be rolling out, and uh, Firefox OS is basically built. Um, it looks like it's, you know, it, it looks like it's apps, but it's all HTML5, basically or HTMLX, whatever you want to call it. Um, there's actually some really cool things that they've done. For example, they actually cache the entire, basically, sign-in's functionality um, in memory, in a sense. Um, they, you know, make you think you have a native experience because you've actually just downloaded everything in the background, uh, and then the, when you have a connection again, it kind of like resyncs. Um, it's, is it a perfect technology? Probably not. Um, you know, I've played with a few of the devices and it's, it's okay. It, it does some you know, okay stuff. Um, is it gonna improve? Probably. I, I don't think that you know, Mozilla would be as bullish on it if they didn't think they had a plan over the next couple of years to improve it. And they, they didn't think that there was the infrastructure to help support that. Um, I think what I guess I'm saying to you is that you're right, it will take a long time to build the infrastructure, 
in that time, there will be a lot of solutions to help make up for that. Yeah. And, yeah. and I'm, not saying, I'm not saying overnight, by the way, native goes to digital. I'm saying there's a drive, a beating drum. The same way that I still download apps to, you know, to my computer, I, I still run Excel locally because I don't trust Windows to run Excel, you know, Excel 360. I, uh, there still will be native apps, but I think, I think every low-hanging fruit will start moving virtual. Um, and I think that's sort of important to take a look at is, you know, all the technology that can help make that happen. So if, if that's the case, Everything is going to move virtual. That's what they just said. Everything's going to try to. I'm going to try to. It's going to virtual. try to move as much as they can from having to live 100% native on your device. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the last four years, whenever there was a new iPhone released, people compared it. Does it have a better processor? Who has the best screen? Who has the best hardware integration? Who has the fastest? Who has the most memory or best memory or fastest memory? So every time I see comparison of mobile phones, or tablets, or anything, I always see the comparison, how good is it, right? So we get a thicker and thicker end device. It's not, it's not going thinner. So the question is really, if that's really the driver, at some point, I mean, the, the driver really is, how fast can I use applications? How many can I use on them? And I, I, don't, I don't see the infection point yet, that people are saying, okay, guys, let's scale back a little bit, let's put the old chipsets in again, and, you know, so I don't see that really. But I think if I could just sort of hazard a guess to what Pat Tomer would, would, would respond to that. Um, it feels like what you're describing sort of happened to the PC a number of years ago, right? Because it used to be where you go into the into Best Buy or whatever, and you would actually really want to look at the specs of the PC. Mm -hmm. Like what's the RAM, and what's the, the CPU, and blah, blah, blah. Now, you kind of don't care. Right, like, I, I mean, like for, for a regular consumer, yeah, I don't really care. Because they have been around for, for uh, 16 years now. And right, now and this is not, right, and this has been around for five years. Yeah, right. So it's, is it, you know, it, will, will it's going to be around for, uh, around for one year, so it's not right. 15. Right, so, well, so it will take 15 years, I mean, I think that's up for debate. I mean, maybe it will, maybe it won't, but I think the point <laughs> is that right now we do care because we are running everything locally. Yeah. As incrementally, not overnight, things move virtually, then the specs on the hardware become less and less important. But yeah, that's going to take. Right. But, but, but anything here. you really want to do on a PC, I mean, really, other than browsing the web, there's stuff that happens locally. You want to edit photos, you want to edit film, you want to uh, uh, do creative work. It happens locally. Actually, editing photos is actually moving at an astronomical rate online. Yeah, well, I get, when I get the full function of Photoshop, the full functionality. So Adobe is working on a full function Photoshop that's purely, <coughs> purely virtual. It's about to really. I think I mean, I've got I've got gobs of memory, huge amount of processing power. How do I get that? That experience. Uh, sure, but I'm, I'm just gonna, uh, just for the sake of, uh, of moving on, because they've been in the, or, you know, the break time. Uh, the, the only thing. We haven't gotten started. So just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just to have the last word, because uh, I'm, I'm able to be up here, I'll only just throw away that. Uh, if, you, if, if you look at the phones working on with Telefonica and the phones that Vodafone is actually working on uh, creating for the Indian market, uh, they are pulling back on the specs heavily, and they are pushing for virtualization. I mean, Vodafone is pushing for a $40 phone to hit India, mm -hmm. and uh, the numbers I've seen the core of Telefonica and Mozilla, uh, which aren't released yet, are just, I mean, it's yeah. just ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, that's completely different. So we can talk about well, the, but, but the point is that there, there's already the push of, you know, you know, maybe some people need all the extra, you know, hardware, but maybe not everyone does yet. And it will take many years for everything to kind of work out, but it is in flux. And like I said at the beginning, you know, we're talking about challenges. And I just think that all challenges are opportunities. So, so Mark, are you going to run a discussion table at lunch? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds almost inevitable. <laughs> so, so the last thing I want to talk about is this concept that we constantly see, um, though I think is going to be uh, made more clear uh, very, very soon. I'm going to just touch on it very lightly. And this concept of websites and, um, and, and apps and web page functionalities, um, oftentimes the comparison you see on the apps versus the web is this comparison. People go, okay, there's about a million apps and there's billions of web pages, right? Um, the last number I pulled up just yesterday before coming here is 196, uh, 196, 000, um, sorry, 196 million websites. We're not talking pages, like Wikipedia is one, right? BBC is two, right? We're talking about, you know, how many high level domains are there out there? 196 million is the last number I got um, that was published by Alexa. Know how accurate that is, but anyways, um, the comparison you really have to look at is the uh, websites, right? The, the like the sites themselves versus the apps, 
And then the analogy would continue. If there are web pages, the question is, how many states actually exist out there? And it's an area that's only now being explored. What I mean states is this. When you look at something like Spotify, right? How many songs can Spotify play? And imagine each, each playing each song is a different state. And that's analogous to a web page, right? Because uh, imagine you can have a link. And in fact, you talk to Yelp, and the way that Yelp actually builds themselves on Android, they do take schema.org's example, and they do, do create a link for every single restaurant. So every time you're in a different state of the app, of Yelp and you're actually looking at a different restaurant, you actually have a different link, right? And that's very analogous to the web page. The reason this is important is that one of the factors that actually slowed the web and then accelerated the web, and this goes back to discovery and something that we're working on, is the concept of uh, actually landing not at the front door of a house, but landing at the exact place you want to. When you look at apps, the same way that back in the day of Yahoo, we looked at websites as sort of just top level, right? It would have been like CNN was one, BBC's two. Um, you only got to that site, then you had to explore from that. Well, what Google really created for the web was the concept of, I can actually go and find you the states of those sites, the actual pages, understand the hierarchy and the ontology, and actually be able to land you the exact solution. Search only really took off when we stopped finding this and we started finding that. Uh, my suspicion is that the same thing's gonna happen on the, uh, in the growth of app world. As soon as standards are out there that make it easier to find the exact functionalities, the exact information, play the right song, play the right movie, you know, edit that, that, that picture in the exact way you want to, right into that, instead of having to always enter from the front. I think that's where you're gonna start seeing a new growth of discovery and actually usage of more and more apps because we don't have to download and they go from the front door every single time. So these are just sort of my uh, trends I'm seeing. Like I said, they're all gonna be controversial and they're all gonna be challenges and opportunities. So finally, um, you know, I think it really is a new frontier. And you look at all these, and you start stacking all the challenges as we start talking about all these, you know, is it the algorithms, the sharing? What we're really talking about is there's a room for about like 5,000 companies to be highly successful, right? I mean, all in parallel. And it's a matter of just actually working with them, collaborating, and seeing where we can solve these problems. So that's it, thanks. Mm -hmm.